Kulhanda. Good afternoon. This is Ben Kewellen, and today I'm taking you into Central Europe's early Celtic cultures. And specifically focusing on one tribe, the Boi, and explaining what that word even means, what happened to these people, where were they, what was the world they were interacting in. So in this video, we're going to go into the history of these people, the boy, the wider world that they were in, the meaning of their name, and what happened to them. Where did they go? As the Iron Age really developed in Central Europe, the Celts emerged as the dominant power across much of the continent, specifically originally in southern Germany, but then definitely in modern day France was their chief base for a while. And one of these tribes that emerged out of this greater region was the Boi. Now, they don't emerge onto this stage historically in writing until the year 390 and the Gallic invasion of northern Italy. They were part of a collection of tribes that moved in. But where were they generally? Bohemia? This takes their name, or their name gave it. Bohemia and Bavaria. Think kind of Austria, Czech, South, East Germany, that area, and even in parts of Poland for a while. So this was quite Eastern and quite in Central Europe. We tend to think of Celts as being the Western fringes of Europe, but for many centuries, this was not the case. And that word boy, what does that mean? So that I ending is a plural given to it by the Latin language. So this is not what they would have called themselves or we don't think so. It would have been something very similar. So that name boy or the boyo, it means cow people basically or a major commodity across much of Europe well into the early modern era even with you have Ireland and Scotland that lasted quite a long time in their culture people moving with the cattle. And as you will see, these boy people really did move around. And that was probably just migrating cattle for a large part of the time. We do have a name, Boyorix. And this is just a name of a king, but he was the king of the Kimbri. This is not related to the Welsh people, Cymru, okay? They came from quite far north, and there's a few disagreements about whether these Cymri were Germanic or Celtic. Personally, I think they were a Germanic people who moved down into Celtic territory and became assimilated into the Celtic speaking culture. And I think this highlights the multicultural, multilinguistic cauldron that was at the time. Rome is important, but the reason in part why it is so important is looking at how much we lost, what was there before them, and how the peoples that were there changed the Romans and through them changed us. So you get those names like Bohemia, Bavaria, as one legacy from these people that we use today. And Bologna, the city. Passau in Germany literally means Fort of the Boy. So they were getting around. As they would have emerged in the Iron Age, the Germanic peoples were beginning to influence and come down into central Germany, which would have pushed on them quite a bit. And a lot of Celtic peoples now 
I say Celtic loosely because from a Roman perspective, in this time period, we're talking like the 4th century BCE, they did not differentiate between what we think of as Celts and Germans. These were just northern barbarians to the Romans, all of them. But these people, boy, were Celtic speaking. I say that loosely. We don't know explicitly, but due to their relations and who they aligned with and when and where they went, we can kind of assume that they were. So the name is like in Welsh, Buch is a cow, and in Irish, Bo. They would have spoken a language closer to Welsh than Irish, by the way, simply because their relations with the Gauls and Gaulish is much closer to Welsh than Irish. See my Gaulish video. It's quite old, maybe I'll redo that. So at the time with these people, you had other tribes like Sinones. You had the Etruscan people, which were not Celtic. You had the Latins, the Romans just were very, these were tiny, the Romans. No one would think that the Romans would ever dominate everybody else. They were the underdog, really. You had Umbrians, Ligurians, what came to be thought of as Gauls, Helvati, all these different tribes, different cultural mixtures. And when the boy came down into Italy in the 390s, they brought with them types of burial, which were not seen in Italy at the time. They buried their dead, which was a bit odd, actually. And so what we have are the burial uh, tendencies changing in the area. So we know that these people were moving in, right? Now, Roman sources say that the boy attacked and eviscerated parts of the Etruscan people when they made present-day Bologna, which was at the time Felsina. So they were seriously involved in this area if they made it their capital, but there's no real evidence that they truly displaced the Etruscans. It seems to be that they intermarried and intermingled with them and created a hybrid Etruscan-Celtic culture for a time. But when they came down into Italy, it's unsure where they came from. They certainly came over the Alps at one point and around them from lands present-day Bavaria. But we don't know if that was where they were from originally. They were a nomadic cattle people, and adopting the Etruscan way of life would have been quite radical because they had cities. And so these people begin making settlements in a very fertile, beautiful land. And the Romans write that the Celts, specifically the boy, coveted the Etruscan lands. They wanted this rich, fertile territory for their own. The Greek historian Polybius writes a lot about these people, well, a lot from what we have. This is what he has to say. They lived in unwalled villages without any superfluous furniture, for as they slept on beds of leaves and fed on meat and were exclusively occupied with war and agriculture, their lives were very simple and they had no knowledge whatsoever of any art or science. Their possessions consisted of cattle and gold because these were the only things they could carry about with them everywhere according to their circumstances and shift where they chose. They treated comradeship as of the greatest importance, those among them being the most feared and most powerful, who were thought to have the largest number of attendants and associates. Now, I don't know how much of that is true, because he's also saying that they expelled the Etruscans, which doesn't appear to have happened. But he does stress the nomadic element. And look at this map here. They went all over the place. They migrated over to Gaul, but these migrations were not the entirety of their people. Some stayed behind north of the Alps, or some were in Italy. They diverged, but they still considered themselves as the same people. The Etruscan cemeteries of the period show a, a merging of Celtic and Etruscan styles. So that's sort of evidence that 
Maybe these people were learning art from the Etruscans. And this area in the north of Italy was called Cisalpine Gaul. And these other tribes around them and the Etruscans, they started to see, well, Rome is expanding here. What do we do? In the second half of the third century BCE, this erupted into a full-scale war with Rome. The Cisalpine Gauls and other peoples like the Etruscans, they aligned together with the boy against the Romans. And Hannibal, who came through with his elephants, they rose up against the Romans to join him. I mean, these people really hated the Romans. They joined up with him and killed a Roman general, Lucius Postumius Albinus, in 216 BCE. And historian Livy tells us that they took the guy's skull and covered it with gold and made it into a, a blessed drinking vessel. This is what he has to say about them. The boy stripped the body of the Roman general Lucius of its spoils and cut off the head and bore them in triumph to the most sacred of their temples. By the way, the fact that he's saying that they have temples does suggest that these were a settled people, which is quite odd. According to their custom, they cleaned out the skull and covered the scalp with beaten gold. It was then used as a vessel for libations and also as a drinking cup for the priest and ministers of the temple. I noticed quite a, a couple things from that. They're quite skilled with gold to be able to do that. One, and if they have priests at this temple, this is a very structured, hierarchical society, very ordered. This is not some savage people without any structure to their social interactions with each other. But this victory came after they had been defeated at another battle, the Battle of Telamon in, in 225 BCE. And the tide was turning against them because Rome was expanding. Rome reformed its armies in the late second century and implemented new styles, new forms of regimentation, which its enemies didn't have any way to fight against. By 191 BC, the Romans defeated the boy again at Modena. According to Strabo, the majority of them left Italy after this defeat. They weren't going to stick around and be annihilated there. But classical writers state that these people were still up in the northeast of that region. They were along the Danube, northeast of the Alps. So they hadn't been wiped out and they were still moving around this region with their cows. Having migrated to Italy from north of the Alps, they just went back to their family, basically, their kinfolk. And they are attacking Roman positions in present-day Austria a short time after that. Julius Caesar says that they had an army of like 32,000. That's an exaggeration, clearly. He liked to boast about himself and the feats of others that made him look good. And after this large attack in Austria, they joined up with the Helvetii, present-day Switzerland, and formed kind of a confederation and schemed to take over parts of southwest Gaul, present-day southwest France. And they were on their way to do that, but Julius Caesar kind of intercepted them and stopped this migration and slaughtered a lot of people. He writes about them in his book, The Gallic Wars. Vercingetorix led his army back to the territory of the Baturiges and advanced from there to Gorgobina, the Opidum of the Boi. Opidum, that's kind of an Iron Age town, basically, whom, defeated in the Battle of the Helvetians, Caesar had installed there and assigned to the Aedui. That's basically, they became the little vassals, right? And laid siege to it. And when Julius Caesar was surrounding the leader of the Gauls, the Vercingetorix, they sent 2,000 people to help fight against Caesar. So it's really odd that they 
then gave him troops, but I guess from their perspective, they're not going to forget that it was the Romans who kicked them out of Italy in the first place, right? I mean, I wouldn't. It's nice weather and you have to live in the cold? No way. According to Strabo, the boy were in the east and they're driven out of two different places in Italy and Gaul. He says, the boy were merely driven out of the regions they occupied and after migrating to the regions around about the Ister, this is further east, and carried on a war against the Daci in 60 BCE. See my video on the Dacian language if you want to know more about them, but basically they were the dominant group in present-day Romania, and they gave Rome a serious challenge for their time, and they fought a war with the boy who the boy lost that war until they perished, tribe and all, and thus they left their territory. However, this is not the end of the boy, because there is record of them after this, even though they'd been kicked out of Italy, been defeated in the Northeast by the Dacians, been wiped out basically in present day France. These guys didn't have an easy time, but they're still going. Other parts of their people had remained closer to their traditional home. So going forward, when the Romans finally conquered that area, or took it over in year eight, Pannonia. There's no record of the boy resisting them or trying to kick them out. It even is called Desert uh, Boyurum, which is like, it means the desert of the boy people, meaning that it's sparsely populated. There's no one left there. They've been killed off. But having been expelled from Italy after long and costly wars, been defeated by Dacia in their homeland, and defeated again in Gaul, and had the Kimri come down, and them essentially be a client people. They, they didn't fare so well being between all these major powers, so they weren't that big in number by this point in the second century of the Common Era. There was a Civitas Boirum et Alzaliorum, Azali were a neighboring tribe, and there weren't enough, I suppose, of either to group them apart, so they grouped them together. And this city had 50,000 inhabitants at one point. For that time, it's quite big. And what just likely happened is they just were slowly assimilated. As you lose your language, you naturally become another people. And they just became Roman slowly and probably then a bit German as well. We have what Livy and a few other historians wrote about them. The only thing we really have by them themselves is this coin here. And the coin says on it, Beatex. And this was minted by the boy uh, around present day Bratislava the capital of Slovakia. And this was in the first century. The word Baitek is also used as the name of those coins. So both the king and the name of those coins. I wanted to show you that tribe, just to show you how much they were moving around. And Central Europe was not one thing during the emergence of Rome. You had people in flocks, moving, migrating, being expelled, aligning with people trying to colonize new territory like the boy did with the Helvetii, merging with people accidentally, intermarrying like they did with the Etruscans, client vassals like they did with the Cimbri and the Gauls, going into open war when they couldn't find any other agreement like they did with the Dacians and the Romans. There's all these different kinds of interactions. This was a very multi-layered, multi-linguistic, multicultural, layered society with different forms of diplomacy from aligning in intermarriage and love to all-out hate and extermination and enslavement. To understand Rome, you need to understand that, which allows you then to understand how the Middle Ages formed out of that world, which then created our world today. If you've come this far and watched the whole video, please consider joining me on Patreon. These are my 10 Patreons currently on the screen now. And I just want to say a heartfelt, warm thank you very much for supporting me and getting this up. 
so that we can do more content for you with more support. Hey, Dios me barrio en Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in the next episode.